my personal connection to those characters uh, deepened the writing a little bit and made it feel uh, more authentic and sincere. And so I wanted to continue that and write a book that was even closer to my life. I wanted to push that limit between realism and reality. Welcome to our latest book reporter talks to interview where our guest today is William Landay and we are going to be talking about his newest novel, All That Is Mine I Carry With Me, which is a book reporter bets on selection and in our current poll, it's the number one book that you are all looking forward to reading. So I am super excited to, about talking to uh, Bill about this. Our reviewer Kate Ayers had this to say in her review, Landay cleverly lays out the trappings of a criminal case from several perspectives leaving readers curious as to who knows what. The whole story is presented in a deliciously layered fashion. By the end, nothing is left to wonder. Well, maybe one little thing. So welcome, Bill, with that introduction. It's so good to see you. <laughs> Thank you. It's good to be here. So I can't believe it's, first of all, that has been a decade since you wrote a book or since Defending Jacob came out. And we'll talk more about that in a bit. But let's start with you telling us about all those mine I carry with me. Tell us about the book and the, the, the plot, et cetera. So this is a story that it uh, it's about a missing woman. And it opened with an eight-year-old girl in 1975 coming home from school one afternoon uh, to find her house empty. Uh, her mother has vanished. There is no evidence of a crime, no sign of struggle. Nothing is out of out of place. Nothing is stolen. Uh, and the mystery of this woman's vanishing uh, is the is the central mystery of the book. Uh, her husband is a, a criminal defense lawyer, a very clever guy, and in some ways an abrasive unlikable guy mm -hmm. and because of these things he immediately becomes uh the primary suspect as you would expect the husband to be the suspect in any missing woman case um and so these children are left with uh the weight of not only their mother's absence but the suspicion that shrouds their father mm -hmm. it's uh it's a mystery that's built around a case that goes unsolved for many many years uh, which uh, defies the conventions of the genre a little bit, but that's the point. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a, it's I, I resist being pigeonholed as a crime writer. I always think that I'm writing family stories or or stories of general interest uh, that happen to involve crime. Uh, and in this case, I wanted to address uh, head on some of the doubt, some of the mystery that that always goes on in real life crimes. I think one of the mm -hmm. one of the false conventions of the genre is that these cases are ever solved. Mm -hmm. Even when you get a guilty verdict, even when you get a confession, uh, there is an error rate and there is a shadow of doubt that surrounds even uh, resolved cases. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to address that head on. There's a limit to what we can know uh, as as people, uh, other people are a mystery, and and criminals, <laughs> especially, are are hard to know. So, uh, I think that's one thing that uh, that crime novels aren't so great about addressing. But it's it's a fact of life. It's a fact of life, and it, it and yes, it's like what you know and what you don't know, and what you knew in 1972 that you might be able to figure out now because there are ring cameras every place and what could yes. you now know and it made, <laughs> made it a lot harder it's made it a lot harder to figure out oh gee well who would not know what so let's go back to the opening lines where the protagonist we learned in a bit is philip solomon speaks in the first person about being empty he mentions struggling and even thinking dark thoughts were you summing up some of your own feelings as you came to write this book like were you saying they're like i haven't written in a really long time and i've got this page in front of me what am mm -hmm. I going to do? <laughs> well, to some extent, it, it's always a struggle for me. I, I I find writing is always difficult. I don't find that even moving from book to book that it gets any easier for me. I've never found it to be uh, the kind of job that you can, uh, you get better at it, of course, but it never gets easier for mm -hmm. some reason. Uh, mm -hmm. The Either your standards keep rising 
or your, uh, I don't know what it is, but I'm never satisfied. I'm always afraid to write and it, I'll only do it when I feel like I have no other choice. Um, so to some extent, yes, that struggle is, uh, is me and is familiar, but what, uh, what Philip says about writing is true. I don't, I don't really think in terms of writer's block. I, I don't, it, it just doesn't describe what's happening there. Uh, it's not that, um, it's not that there's some kind of uh, uh, neurosis that's preventing me from writing. It's that writing is hard. Mm -hmm. And sometimes cracking the difficult problems that you run into takes time mm -hmm. and takes struggle. Uh, uh, Philip Roth, who's, who's one of my favorites, used to say that the, the struggle is part of the process. Mm -hmm. and, and that philosophy has helped me a lot. I do feel like wrestling with these demons and, and working your way through these difficult problems tends to result in a better book mm -hmm. uh, you know you make choices that are inventive and that surprise the reader and as a reader myself that's the kind of book that uh that delights me that mm -hmm. that that i find interesting i i don't like books where i can see what's coming next mm -hmm. uh, and so you know as a as a writer you want to recreate that experience for your own readers and mm -hmm. so you know it takes 10 years because sometimes it takes 10 years. Maybe the next book will be easier and I'll bang it out in six months, but <laughs> that tends not to be my way. No, no, it's not. And it's, but by the same token, the book delivers. And I think that that's the most important thing that people really want to think about at this point. Sometimes people are doing a book a year. A lot of the books that were written during the pandemic, especially, I thought were not that strong. And it's because you knew that people were dealing with other things. And there was a whole raft of books that I don't think were the writer's best. And they've written since then much better. And, yeah. but there's that, do this, do this, do this, get out on this timing, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So every yeah, I, mean, I, I, I want to avoid that because I do mm -hmm. feel like that's, that's a pressure that we should never put our writers under. I feel like when you, if you have a writer that you love, it's like having a band that you love or a movie mm -hmm. director, a movie mm -hmm. actor, you know, when you, when you get the, the band's new record or you see mm -hmm. the new movie or whatever it is, you're trusting that person, that brand to deliver for you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to me as a reader, I don't care if uh, Ian McEwen is one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. I don't care if he's produced a book a year or if I wait two years or three years when the book comes out, I'll read it. But when I see his name on the cover, I know, I know what I'm, that I'm going to get a certain level of quality and care and thought. Mm -hmm. And that's all I care about. And it's mm -hmm. the same with the band. I, you know, I've been uh -huh. following Bruce Springsteen for 40 years, 50 years now. I, I'll see I, if he wants to keep me waiting five years for the next one. That's fine. Yeah. So you're going to go see him in concert? Did you get tickets? Yeah, I got, he's actually coming to Boston next week. And uh, I didn't get tickets for that one. So I'm going in the summer to, uh, he's doing a football stadium tour in the summer. So I'll, I'll go I'll see him that. I, I saw him it. in 83 and I'm going to see him in 2023. So oh, I love 40 it. years apart. Yeah, I'm the big Paul Simon fan. So I'm for the uh, first time. You're a Jersey that. girl who's not a who's not a Springsteen fan? Somewhat, but Where did you more, go on? yeah, I know. It's like me. I I guess from I was originally from Queens and I don't know it. But um <laughs> but definitely Paul Simon since 1970, though. It's been mm -hmm. like you know that long. And I remember being in seventh grade and then playing a song, playing Sound of Silence, and I just couldn't mm -hmm. understand what's Sound of Silence. And I think it's the same kind of thing though, when he delivers something, it's quality. Like when exactly. he delivered, he takes a very long time in between albums. He's not touring anywhere. There's rumor that he's working on something. And he did mm -hmm. this actually brilliant piece um, last year. Um, and he did an interview and I'm trying spacing who he did the interview with. And it was this, uh, it was an a, a audio original, um, Malcolm Gladwell. He did it with Malcolm mm -hmm. Gladwell. And it was, he talked about his songs and deconstructed what he'd done. And this mm -hmm. band that, those are the moments that you really feel like you're getting inside somebody's head and you're seeing yes. they didn't just throw it out there. There was something behind what they did. Right. And, and that I mean, long connection that you feel with someone like Paul Simon or, or you must have favorite Springsteen. writers that you've yeah, been following yeah. for a very long time as well, it becomes a personal connection. It's a, it's a level of trust. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what I think is important. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I want my readers to trust me. Mm -hmm. uh, and and that's the that's the highest uh, reward you can you can have is readers who who believe in you. 
Yeah. Uh, and so that's, you know, that's the reward for all this. That's the game. That's the game is figuring out what to do this. So every book's got something that's a springboard to get it started. Something that this is where the idea is going to come from. What was it for this book? <laughs> well, in some ways, uh, it was the anti-springboard. And the anti-springboard was it wasn't going to be defending Jacob II. Right. I knew that. Exactly. Um, yeah. One thing that I've always thought is I I want each book to uh, to be a challenge. And I want to constantly get better and constantly raise the bar. And the one thing that I didn't want is to get conservative. I didn't want to play it safe in order to protect my uh, gains. Mm -hmm. uh, so Defending Jacob, in a way, was a turn for me. Uh, the books that preceded it were, uh, I don't want to say they were stereotypical crime novels, but they were typical mm -hmm. in some in the sense that they uh, involve street crime. Mm -hmm. And with Defending Jacob, uh, the goal or one of the goals was to write a book that felt more personal to me and where I was closer to the surface. Mm -hmm. So it involves a, a prosecutor and a family uh, whose, whose life parallels my own in a lot of ways. And so in this book, I wanted to continue that because I felt like my personal connection to those characters uh, deepened the writing a little bit and made it feel uh, more authentic and sincere. And so I wanted to continue that and write a book that was even closer to my life. I wanted to push that limit between realism and reality. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when the book opens, uh, with a writer whose whose life parallels my own in some ways, and whose long silence parallels my own in some ways. In part, what I'm doing there is leaning into that personal investment uh, mm -hmm. in these books. Um, I wanted readers to feel my presence there. Uh, Orwell says there's a famous uh, essay that Orwell wrote about Dickens, where he says that with great writers, uh, you feel the sense of their face behind the page. Mm -hmm. I wanted readers to feel that too. I want, I want, uh, I want them to feel my presence uh, in that story. And I think that, uh, well, I shouldn't say I think it. I hope yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that that's the effect. That's the effect of what ends up happening. A reviewer, Kate, asked if this book is based loosely or otherwise on any case you came across in your years of prosecution. Anything with missing person uh -huh. or. Well, uh, I wouldn't get into where the exact line is between between fact and fiction here, because I think that uh, one of the points of this book, one of the reasons the book works is that it feels different. It mm -hmm. feels a little too real, a little too close to life. And I don't want to rob it of that. Uh, I think there's a little chill that you get when it starts to brush up against reality that way. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to intrude on the reader's experience uh, uh, by saying this is this happened, this didn't happen. Uh, so what I will say, though, is that um, I try never to draw directly on real cases. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I and this is mentioned in the book as well. Um, I do believe that that families uh, of, and, and victims of crimes never volunteer uh, to be in the public eye. And I feel that it's a little uh, unfair and unkind uh, to take their stories and turn them into uh, the sort of uh, fantasies that we sell. Um, so I try to stay away from that. On the other hand, we live in the world. You can't help mm -hmm. being influenced uh, by what's happening. Uh, and missing woman cases are are unfortunately common. They're more common than we like to think. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's no shortage of of this sort of case, um, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Well, you know, it's interesting. I was watching a piece last night on, or documentary, I think it was four parts on Netflix last night called The Killing Fields of what's happened mm -hmm. of these missing women in Texas. And they've all been in this one area. And it was fascinating to see how long you're exactly talking about these people were gone and i was thinking of your book as i was watching it because this was decades of the girl didn't come home she was at the phone booth oh somebody picked her up in a bar and there were clusters they were all buried in this one area and what was happening 
I watched Murder in Bighorn on Showtime and it was really interesting because they're talking about the indigenous women that are all along this one highway and it's going up to Canada mm-hmm. and what's happening that these people are going missing and are we ever going to find them again? And you watch the families with that sense of, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know. And I feel yeah. like watching those, I feel like it was captured in the book of the anxiety that constantly pervades of, right. is she coming home? Where'd she go? And in, and in some ways, the not knowing is worse than the tragedy. Exactly. Uh, you know, the if if you had found that she had been murdered, as as most often these women are, um, and you can at least begin to work on on grieving and moving on. Mm-hmm. If you don't know, if it's just an unresolved case that lingers for decades, that's its own kind of torture, and I I, I can't even imagine the. The stress or i guess i can't imagine it because i did <laughs> you did it you did it you did it very very well and we'll just take it together just stay on this other killing thing for just one second but they actually created models of two of these people and they were in their 20s and 30s and they had been missing and their families didn't even have a clue that they might be down there and it was the, 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 the it was just a really interesting after reading this book and after thinking about people being missing for a long period of time mm-hmm. it was what we can do now with uh reconstruction of um bones that are found things that they can figure out for, that we yeah. didn't have the forensics the forensics that's the word carol that you didn't have back to your book though we meet jeff one of the siblings first and he's described as being a prince in high school what makes him a <laughs> prince in high school i love that it's like a prince uh, in high school he, he's know? a he's a prince in the sense that uh philip goes to a, a uh a very strict and traditional uh old school sort of uh uh prep school in boston and he feels, uh, Philip feels like a bit of an intruder. This is our narrator. Uh, his friend, Jeff, who's the son of this missing woman, um, his older brother goes there and has, has he's had several family members go there. So he feels entitled to his place at this school. Mm-hmm. Uh, whereas uh, our narrator, Phil, feels like a, uh, an interloper, a newcomer, an Araviste. Yeah, that's exactly. Very close to the beginning, when Philip meets with Miranda, he sees a tattoo on her that reads Omnia Mea Mecum Porto. That's my, that's my badly just said Latin. All that is <laughs> mine, I carry with me. Was that always the working title? Like, did that happen early or did that come later to have that be no, the tattoo that's you mean, on you mean the title? Yes. As it, no, as the as title, I have such trouble with titles. Um, and that came very late as a title. I, I always struggle uh, to come to the right title. And this one, because it's so long, mm-hmm. um, I wasn't sure of. I, I kind of like the awkwardness of it now. I think it makes the title sticky and memorable. Uh, and I also like the, I love that line. Mm-hmm. And it, uh, so the detail was always there in the book uh, right from the start. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it didn't become the title until very late in the process. In fact, I noticed the the detail comes from there was a, a a young woman who worked at the coffee shop I used to go to who had that tattoo. Wow, uh, arm, arm exactly like that. And so I'm always hoping that somewhere I don't I have haven't seen this woman in years. But we talked about it at the counter one day as I was getting my coffee, uh, and she should have I, she should have known she was talking to a writer. Anything is fair game. <laughs> But I, I imagine somewhere out there, there's a woman with this tattoo on her arm who's going to read this book and think, wait a minute. <laughs> wait, 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 a title, a tattoo. It. No, and it was great because he said it's kind of like worn because it's been there for a while. It's, you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's not fresh tattoo. It's been there for a while. Right. Um, and it's not written to display. It's not a show off kind of tattoo. It's written on the underside of her arm. Mm-hmm where it's actually very hard for her to show it to other people. It's meant for her to look down and read it and be reminded of this philosophy of self-reliance and not being caught up in other people's uh, anxieties and opinions and pressures. And this is something that for Miranda is a difficult thing. She is an emotional person uh, and she has troubles with uh, depression and self-regulation. And so for her, it's always a struggle to live up to this ideal, um, to know that what she carries within herself is enough Mm -hmm. and that she can be uh, the captain of her own emotions. Mm -hmm. Uh, This is something that she 
will struggle with over the course of her lifetime. And it's especially cruel that uh, her mother's vanishing happens to uh, a fragile person like her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, she just isn't uh, built for for this kind of tragedy. And so, you know, this is the payoff of these kind of stories. You can take characters like this who are interesting and thoughtful in their own ways and put them under pressure, mm -hmm. put them under stress and see what happens. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's, you know, she's a she's an interesting character to uh, to place in the middle of this story. And she goes and tries to invent another family for herself as well. She tries to make another mom. She tries to make siblings. She tries to make a, uh, something. It's mostly the mom. And I don't I'm not going to give too much away. And I promise I won't do that. But it's just she just tries to do something to invent the security that she feels that she needs. And she's yes. not secure in herself. So she's got to be secure with another unit. And especially it's got to be a woman. It can't be another she's man. So, she so wants to be part of a family. She mm -hmm. so misses uh, what she's lost, which is a mother, an intact family, a home. Mm -hmm. And you can tell even on the day that she comes home and, and finds uh, her mother missing that the the warmth has gone out of her house even, that she mm -hmm. doesn't, it doesn't feel like home anymore. She, and this isn't giving anything away either, but as she's wandering around the empty house, one of her immediate thoughts is that it's just a building now. Mm -hmm. uh, the The Larkin family will pass through it. Other people, other families have lived there before hers. Other families will live there after. Uh, and that it's not her unique home mm -hmm. anymore. And that mm -hmm. sense of our own transience and our own vulnerability is something that as kids, especially, we don't like to think about. As as we grow up and get older, we we have an easier time accepting the reality of it. But but for a kid like Miranda, who's who's really, you know, she's a little kid when this happens. Mm -hmm. It's very very difficult. And so she does go out into the world, uh, looking for ways to fill that hole. Mm -hmm. She's got her three Oreos, but now <laughs> after she has her three Oreos and a glass of milk, and maybe she's not supposed to have three. She's only supposed to have two. But after that. <laughs> She doesn't want that freedom. She wants the, she doesn't want the freedom. She wants somebody to be there to take care of her, to do certain mm -hmm. rituals with her as life goes on and things like that. And the right. adopting of somebody else is not really what's going to end up working. So then we get to hear from Jane, the woman who's deceased. And why do we get to hear from Jane? Because Jane gives us a lot of info. <laughs> Jane does give us a lot of info. It's, um, you know, I, I knew going into this that, that we were gonna jump around in time, that it was gonna be a fragmented sort of storytelling. Uh, and that we were gonna jump around a point of view as well. Uh, and I don't wanna to give too much away about this because part of the reading experience is the uh, joy of these jolts, of these mm -hmm. jumps. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's hard to talk about the book without talking about the book. So, um, you know, a lot of those decisions about who would be narrating the different sections and when they would occur and how much time could be uh, elided in jumping from one uh, uh, segment to, the, to another was really about solving problems. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you're trying to tell this story in a way that's interesting and inventive and unexpected, and you tend to write yourself into corners. If you're going to write from the perspective of uh, first person narrators, you're necessarily limiting the knowledge of each. You're limiting mm -hmm. uh, your ability to uh, to do exposition. Um, so you're looking for ways out of that, and you're looking for um, for ways to jolt and surprise the reader. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is, I mentioned Ian McEwan earlier. Uh, one of my favorites is is Atonement, which is a book that is told in a similar uh, fragmented way and it's it's like a puzzle for the reader to put together. And I think that uh, there is a kind of delight as a reader in being engaged that way and being involved uh, in, in assembling the story for yourself that way. There's a moment at the end of Atonement where the pieces kind of click into place <laughs> and it's just electric when you, when you get there. I think that all, uh, all good books uh, all books that kind of come off the page and, you know, you have these vivid reading experiences. Some books are flat. It doesn't always work. Mm -hmm. But when it works, it's this uh, 
dialogue between you and the writer. It's it's something that had the the reader has to actively participate in creating the story for herself. Mm-hmm. And I want to invite readers to to play their part and to make connections. And so there's a lot of uh, links that could have been drawn. I could have spelled out every connection, every clue, every mm-hmm. whatever. Uh, and left very little work for the reader to do. Uh, But I think that readers like to be engaged, and I Mm -hmm. think they they need to make those leaps for themselves sometimes, especially now. I feel like there's so much content out there. We're all just pelted with Mm -hmm. with pinging phones and tweets and updates Mm -hmm. all day long. There's so much stuff coming at us we're used to getting information in a fragmentary kind of way. And we're used to making links ourselves and making inferences ourselves. And we're also used to writing off a lot of this as just noise and not paying attention and tuning things out. And so I wanted to invite the reader to do do something similar uh, in this case, Uh, receive these fragments of information and and make your own connections. Uh, See how something in book one is picked up in book two Mm -hmm. Uh, and i i i think that for the reader it's it's an exercise that's going to feel very true to uh to this moment uh that we that we are all living in which by the way is a hard time for novelists and for novel readers Mm -hmm. alike because we are trained uh to skim to surf um you know we 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 flick up and down our phones and we read little tweets and we just can't seem to maintain the sort of focus that for our parents and grandparents might have come a lot more naturally. I mm-hmm. often think of someone yeah. like Dickens or, or Melville writing Moby Dick where he'll go off for 50 pages about the color white or about how you dissect a whale. And I just think, oh my goodness, you couldn't write this way now. Nobody's got to read that. No. But when he was writing, most of his readers were at home mm-hmm. without electricity, with no radio, no music, no TV, no internet. What else were they going to do? You know, they would follow Melville for 50 pages and, and read about that just because it's interesting. Now, it's a lot to ask readers to uh, to maintain the kind of long-term mm-hmm. intense focus that novel reading requires. And so one thing I wanted to do with this book was to meet today's readers where they are living in this crazy environment that we live in. I know that when people are reading my book, their phone will be pinging mm-hmm. <laughs> right next to them. I know some of them will be reading on their phone, on the Kindle app, and they'll be two clicks away from you know, the Yankee score or the weather or whatever is happening in Washington. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and so I think one way to defeat that is to present them with the sort of story that, that the world presents them with, which is fragmentary and incomplete and developing before your eyes and and invite them to make their own uh, connections. I feel like that is the way we live now and it's the way we read now. Mm-hmm. And, and that is... Unfortunately, our <laughs> experience, I wouldn't want to go back to the 19th century for too many reasons. Life is better now in almost every way, right. but it would be kind of nice to go off to a log cabin somewhere and read Moby Dick without my phone pinging at me all day. Yeah, it's like, it's just that thing all day long, bing, you have to, like, what do you have to do? <laughs> like, I have something binging right now that it's not happening in a second, but it happens and I'm like, it's not a message. What is this? Like, what alert can I turn off now? Let's figure that out tonight. So Jane has this line where the subject comes up before they're married about money. And she says he's rich. And he responds, no, my parents are. And she says that she did not understand the distinction, but perhaps she should have. And she um, goes on and on to say that um, she should have listened harder. Let's talk about that as money is often the catalyst in a marriage breaking down. And for her, this money thing is out there. And I'll just, just to play it through, it's the money is inherited. The family's laid out by Dan's mom. Money's for the spouse and his wife until they die. No money goes to you. And the same happens for future generations. That's the way the trust or whatever it is is set up. 
And for this is for clarity for Jane, like she's dating this guy. And his mother like drags her in the bedroom and says, look, I need to have this conversation about you. But it's not about the money always, is it? It's not always about the money, but the money does play into it. Yeah. And it's, uh, it, this is, it's an issue. Money is always an issue uh, uh, for everyone. And it, it often seems to be an issue in the, in these uh, missing women cases and in ordinary divorces, any kind of split up. Mm -hmm. It's just hard for couples to get around this, especially when there's a lot of money at stake. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dan Larkin comes from a wealthy family, uh, but the family uses money as a form of control in mm -hmm. some ways. Mm -hmm. And that creates uh, pressure on Dan, uh, who's used to living uh, an expensive lifestyle, mm -hmm. uh, but doesn't necessarily have the funds to uh, pull it off. Mm -hmm. uh, people assume he's rich become, because he's from a wealthy family, but he doesn't have access to that money necessarily. And his, his, uh, his own parents are uh, a little uh, controlling about it. Mm -hmm. So... It's a source of friction in their marriage, and it's a source of friction uh, just in terms of their background and temperament, because uh, Jane comes from a family that doesn't have money, mm -hmm. and she she's uh, taught that, that money isn't important and that money certainly can't buy happiness, which is true. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's something that this, this married couple has to negotiate, and I don't... I don't know that Jane ever really gets to an understanding of how mm -hmm. Dan feels about it. Mm -hmm. Dan is mysterious in a lot of ways, uh, certainly to his wife. Mm -hmm. And and that is, you know, that's true of a lot of people's experience as well. We don't understand people all that well necessarily. And that's just the human condition. Uh, you know, in some ways, defending Jacob was about parents looking down the family tree at their children and trying to understand them this is about you know children looking up the family tree at their parents and and trying to understand them and and <laughs> jane looking across at her husband and, and mm -hmm. trying to understand him mm -hmm. and you know the mystery of of what's going on in, in dan larkin's head is is what drives the book it really? is a try the book. Yeah. Especially when she finds that he's doing something, I'm not going to give it away. And it's something that she completely planned. And she's like, oh, isn't that kind of interesting of what's going on? I'm watching that unfold before me that I planned. And it's, yeah. and yeah. It, but getting inside her head, we understand him a lot more, even though we can't understand him completely from her. We can right. understand him more because she's sharing what she's seen about him the way he tips extravagantly, the way he throws money here, there, the other place. And for him, money's power. Money is, yeah. money's going to get you the table you want, the this you want, the that you want. And she's like, we're going to go broke as you're sitting there, like, you know, throwing this money around. And yeah. well, remember, she, she comes from a family where you really could go broke. In yes. his mind, it's it, going broke just isn't something he's ever really uh, uh, lost too much sleep over. So yes. it's, a, it's a constant source of, friction between them but this is what's what's interesting if you know this is a book that covers a very long time span mm -hmm. and so you get to watch dan uh grow from you know from a high school kid all the way to an old man uh, mm -hmm. to the very end of his life and it, you know these issues play out <laughs> over a very long period in very interesting ways mm -hmm. and in some ways the things that we think about and worry about as teenagers do trail us all through life. The, we all have our little quirks and obsessions. And and I don't know if if Dan himself ever really gets to grips uh, with money. He's, you know, he he wants to be a player. He like he has likes to dress and and uh, you know drive fancy cars and do all of it with a certain style. Uh, and that need to fund uh, that lifestyle uh, shapes him. Mm -hmm. it so is. It gets, and and it, we, we don't know uh, to what extent it may or may not uh, have provided a motive for this crime, uh, but it's there. It's there as a possible motive. And that is part of the mystery. Mm -hmm. It's part of like, what's out there? How did this happen? You know, there's a detective that can't get this case out of his mind. It's years. And he still wants to crack this one. 
And I've seen this often that somebody says that there's a case that keeps me up at night. This is it. There are any cases that you worked on that you're practicing that you still think about of like either the outcome should have happened like that. Sure. Did it happen like that? It stays with you, right? Oh, sure. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, definitely, especially victim cases, because you feel uh, you feel an obligation to the victim to to put things right to the extent that things can be put right. right. Uh, and, you know, a murder case is a special kind of victim case because the victim can't be known. Uh, and what's interesting to me is that uh, in homicide cases, it, it, there's a, there's a, almost more of an allegiance to these victims who, by definition, can't be known. Uh, and yet it feels like a personal death. So, yeah, I think that the, the Detective Glover's experience and his response to this case uh, is not as unusual as we might think. You know, mm -hmm. with there's such a long tradition of uh, tough guy noir detectives that we kind of presume that that's how they must be. Yeah. That's how all detectives yeah. must be. And Everybody's course, there boss. Are, there, are Everybody. guys. there are hard guys out there, I'm sure. Yeah. But there are just as many who who are doing this, you know, precisely because they it's you know it's coming from their heart and they're they're personally emotionally invested in these cases and and those are the best cops because they will hustle they will go the extra mile they'll do anything to to make sure the case comes out right mm -hmm. and make sure it all works you know yeah you know there's a jolt to the family when the person's gone because then they need the answers and then the body's found and when jane's found it's like people think there's closure but then it opens up more questions it's like new questions emerge just because she's there and then the sides get taken again because before it's like gone, oh, what happened? Now it's like, wait a second, gone. How were you involved? How were you involved? Did you know anything? And it becomes either the family pointing questions and then everybody on the outside saying, why? How did it happen? Where did you go? So you open up something as soon as the body gets found. And it's on the jacket of the book. It's not like I'm giving something away. And yeah. then the whole yeah. family divides over what are we going to do? And do they divide? I think it's an interesting question for the reader is do they divide the way you think they would divide? Or do you think different people would align with each other? You know? Right. And we assume that uh, that families will react in a uniform way. Mm -hmm. And yet we all know that even in the same family, there are very different personalities. You can take any uh, ordinary Thanksgiving dinner and you'll find all kinds of people sitting around the table, mm -hmm. even though they come from uh, almost identical backgrounds. Um, and so I think that that the way the Larkin family splits on this case uh, feels right to me. Uh, there's always mm -hmm. frictions within families. And again, this is a family that is uh, pushed to the utmost, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's hard enough to get to get through Thanksgiving dinner. Uh, imagine being pushed to this extreme. Uh, and these are what we're really talking about here is the three Larkin kids, all of whom have uh, different temperaments of the three. There's three kids. There's, uh, there's Alex, who's the oldest, who's kind of conservative, uh, who, who's almost, who almost can't entertain the thought that his father might have done this. And 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 can't uh, feels that it would be a betrayal to even suspect his father, to even question his father. Uh, and there's a middle, uh, his younger brother Jeff, who's the middle child, uh, perhaps as a middle child as I am, uh, <laughs> finds it very natural to uh, think in unorthodox ways and to question everything. Um, and so Jeff and Alex in particular have butt heads about this, mm -hmm. uh, as brothers often do. Um, and it's a question of temperament and personality uh, and and not just about the state of the evidence because they're both working from a common set of facts and they're both being reasonable, intelligent, well-meaning, and they're simply drawing different conclusions from the evidence that's available to them and there's simply no way for either of them to know that they're right and the other is wrong. Mm -hmm. And and so there's no way for them to move past it. Um, it's just a an impossible situation. And and it I, I I wouldn't say it tears the family apart, but it torments them. Mm -hmm. uh, they because they they can't be torn apart because they remain siblings. They simply don't have the option of walking away. Uh, and that is 
Uh, <laughs> that's how families work. You don't get to opt out of a family. You know, you can like a tear. You can away if you like, but your your last name is your last name. It's a tear. There's still a piece of paper, but there's a tear in it. And the tear mm -hmm. is who's exactly. which side are you on? You, you do something really interesting with long strings of back and forth dialogue with just words, with no descriptions attached to them. He said, she said, whatever. Why that? Why did you do that in one section of the book? Well, part of it, part of it is I just love that kind of storytelling. <laughs> As a reader, I love it. It feels very uh, Elmore Leonard to me. I, and I love the, uh, the art, the skill of uh, storytelling through dialogue, of pushing information out in a way that feels uh, uh, effortless and, and incidental to what's going on. Uh, but the story is moving as you're reading those conversations. And, and I love that. Uh, the other piece of it is this is the one way to think of this novel is a suite of four novellas. And I wanted each of these books uh, to have its own feel, its own grammar, its own sound, its own syntax. And so these are four different voices. I wanted it to feel almost like four different writers. Um, <laughs> one of the experiences that I had with Defending Jacob, which I, I, I didn't know going in, was uh, there were transcript uh, sections in that book that were uh, reproductions of what grand jury transcripts essentially look like. And those were in a different font from the rest of the book. And so in the first time I introduced it, there was a little bit about, you know, this is a grand jury transcript in such and such a case. And then it looked like a typeface. I didn't know that ebook readers can't reproduce multiple fonts like that. Right. So in the printed book, you, the reader gets the experience that I intended, which is that you learn after the first few uh, encounters with this, oh, now we're back in the grand jury. And just by presenting that format, I wouldn't have to introduce anything. Uh, I wouldn't have to reorient the reader. She would automatically know. So coming into this book, I wanted to be able to reorient the reader constantly as well, but this time I had to do it uh, only in ways that that didn't involve the visual presentation of it. It had to be purely a matter of writing style. Mm -hmm. uh, and so in this case, I wanted to make sure uh, without resorting to visual tricks like that, to book design, uh, that you knew the minute you started hearing this new voice that this was a new voice. This was a different person. This just, you know, didn't sound like uh, uh, the previous narrator. Uh, you know, with the audio book, in, in this case, where I insisted that there be four different readers uh, because there are four different voices. And in a way, that's an advantage that the audio book has over the written book here. Right. You can, you can actually hear the different voices. But uh, for the written book, that's something that the reader has to... Uh, imagine. And so I, I really wanted these books to be able to stand alone as novellas. Uh, and in some ways, I think you could uh, re reshuffle books one through four, you mm -hmm. could read them three, one, four, two, and whatever, mm -hmm. and you still have a coherent story. Mm -hmm. um, you know, or you could print only book one or, or, or book four, uh, read them in isolation, and you would have uh, a, a completed unit. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I love the idea of, of these fragmentary stories. Uh, and I love the idea that when you get to the end, you feel like you've had these multiple experiences. One, one of the great things about books is that because, and what we talked about earlier, because the reader has to uh, pick the words up off the page and perform them for herself, it's this intimate uh, way of experiencing a story. You, you read it in your own mind. And with a first person narrator, especially, you are internally experience a story in your mind, but from the perspective of another person, mm -hmm. you are learning to see the world through another person's eyes. You're learning uh, literally to empathize. Mm -hmm. And that is, that's the, the foundation of morality that you can't you can't be cruel to another person if you can imagine what it is like to be that person. Mm -hmm. So I feel that this is such an important skill for, for all of us to have and to, to practice, to get our reps in and get stronger with 
And so this book is, is really just an extreme form of that. What you get here is four different chances to slip on the mask of another person and to start seeing the world as they see it. You know, it's one thing to see uh, Jeff Larkin uh, making his father crazy or doubting his father or uh, self-destructing in, in various ways as he tends to do. Uh, it's another thing to slip into the mind of Jeff uh, in the middle of the story uh, or slip out of the mind afterward uh, and and to see what it's like to really walk through a story like this. So so the idea of switching perspectives like that is uh, is immersive and 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 good for you, I think. Yeah. And well, the other thing is I didn't want to do what you often see is is books that will switch perspective chapter by chapter. Yes. And they jump back and forth from one point of view to another, one narrator to another. And I want, I always find that uh, disruptive. Mm -hmm. it's, it's much more immersive, I think, to jump into a character's perspective and stay there, live in it for a while, really walk around in the world for an extended period, seeing the world through their eyes and hearing their voice. I always find that the chapter by chapter thing just when you're getting used to someone's voice, you're jumping to another and you're mm -hmm. constantly jumping back and forth. And it tends to be more of a superficial experience because you're just constantly being uh, jogged out of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, I wanted to, I wanted it to be chunks like that. I wanted it to be deep. I wanted it to be thick, a thick experience. And it's, it's interesting because for the audio book, it's so much easier to do dialogue <laughs> going back and forth instead of so is it? He said, da da da. She said, blah 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 blah. <laughs> going back and forth, and you're. So I always think about the audio because the audio has become so important. And think about the poor reader who's saying they're reading. She said, she said. I've listened to it. It's it's she a said, very hard book for the audiobook readers to do because you're doing dialogue. Really, they have no choice because there's so little. He said, she said. Uh, they have to do it in voices, and yes. so you see them. But not only are they imitating the voices in the dialogue it's told through a first person narrator. So they've already assumed the voice, the, the narrator's voice. And so what they're imitating is the narrator imitating the voices of the speakers. Mm -hmm. It's incredibly demanding. I often thought that because the uh, Philip Solomon, the, the narrator of the first book, uh, obviously is, is an avatar of my own, that it would it'd be interesting for me to be the reader of, of book one of the audio book, just to sort of, add another meta uh, level to this whole thing. But then I saw what it was and I just thought, that's crazy. You need a professional actor to do this. There's no way I could have pulled it off. I didn't realize I swallow. I don't realize all the things I do with my bath <laughs> until then, you know? It's very, book reading is such a hard thing. I, it is, that is a real skill that these people have. It's, and you know, many people are now reading their books aloud because yeah. they realize the audio experiences and you see that you repeat a word, you see this, that, the other thing that you don't see when you're looking at the page and says, how did I say that that many times, you know? Yes. Well, the so, other thing is you, you know, novels aren't written to be read aloud. Mm -hmm. They're written to be heard in your head mm -hmm. and, and they can't be rewritten for the audiobook. I can't, I, if I were writing a script to be read aloud like a radio show, I would have I would script it differently. I would script something that sounds good when read by an actor. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't take into account very long sentences and the need to breathe and, <laughs> and different intonations and all that stuff. You know, a dramatist would write di very differently from a novelist, yeah. and uh, it, it makes such a difference to the audiobook experience that, that whether you have a good reader or a bad one. Um, and uh, as we've discussed, audiobooks are becoming so important now that it's something that you really have to think about. Well, I must, I must pick the right, the right, um, the narrators in order to tell my story well. You know, it's in order yes. to be present it well. It's true. Yes. But then by book three, they, even the quotation marks disappear for the rest of the book. I mean, those are <laughs> off the page. Okay. I did read this book carefully and I'm like, wait a second now. Now we've abandoned the quotation marks yes. too. Where are English we going? English teachers with are going to have a, have a, a, a fun time with this one. Yeah, the proofreaders are going to be putting all those back in and you're going to be yanking them back out because <laughs> no, that's not what happens here. And the proofreaders would give me long notes about this is intended. Don't correct every, don't add quotation marks as you go through these page after page of dialogue. 
But it was really interesting because I a number of readers come to this um, event that we do every month called Bookachino Live, which is our when, second Wednesday of the month where we preview books. And a lot of times they'll say to me, they'll ask me a question, and it'll be, why are there no quotation marks in some books? <laughs> or there's no he said, she said. And why do people do this? And what you're doing is you're saying, I'm giving you a stop, a different perspective. And I can share that next month with them as an answer because it's something that deliberate that happens. Um, I know Elizabeth Brundage has done it before. I know that there are you know, like authors that's like a signature of something that they do. Right. But is it really that you then can pull your own perspective of, is he mad? Is he this? Is he that? He said loudly or quietly or whatever. You just get in your head, you figure it out. Yeah. I think that's right. I think there's also, and, and again, this is reader dependent too. A lot of different readers will experience this differently. They'll uh, they'll like it or not like it. Um, mm -hmm. But one thing that it might achieve for some readers, hopefully, is that it's it presents a very open page, a very simple page, and you and you you slip through it in kind of a frictionless way. You stop noticing uh, the quirky uh, uh, syntax. And you just focus more on the words. Mm -hmm. uh, if you, especially if you have a Elmore Leonardy kind of page where it's a lot of short sentences, mm -hmm. as which is true to natural conversation, mm -hmm. you just don't need to clutter up that page with a million quotation marks, uh, which is more for the reader's eye to to bump along as they're going from line to line. Mm -hmm. If you present it in a stripped way. Uh, you're inviting the reader to move down the page more quickly in a more uh, uh, fluid and smooth and frictionless way and experience the conversation in in a more natural rhythm uh, than, than you might otherwise. Uh, yeah. That's the intention anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> whether it works or not, I think for some readers it will. I think some readers will think it's an affectation and, and they'll find it uh, uh, pretentious or just odd. And, if you're and listening, I don't know why you know why it was done. That's the reason. But I picked up on it, and I said I kept making notes. Or not, I, I fold down pages. This is really bad. Just I read galleys. Fold down pages, <laughs> and I don't. I actually don't write like underline. And I come back to that page later and say, why did I say something on this page? Because mm -hmm. my answer may have come later in the book. Like sometimes I can. Oh, I can unfold that. I see why that question was there, but it's gone. But these, I saw oh, wait, this changed. Oh, wait, this changed. And it did give me a signal of, it's not just missing off the page because the copywriter or proofreader forgot to do it. There's some intent. And to understand the intent, I think makes really you know interesting for readers. So was it always four parts? Did you always see this as four parts? Or, Carol, seriously, I was writing as I went. <laughs> no, I think it was, um, it was originally three parts and a very brief epilogue to kind of tie it together. Um, one thing that fell away from the book that was that was a, a part of it originally was who's really writing this? Mm -hmm. You have all these different speakers, uh, but can we presume that uh, that the the name on the front of the book uh, is is the true author? Uh, and and again, that's you know true to atonement as an inspiration for this book. Uh, and so that kind of fell away. And I, I felt like that was a one wrinkle too many. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it was one sort of uh, meta game too many. It was a little too cute. Um, and that freed up that fourth section to be more than just about, uh, about the authorship of the book. Uh, it was more about the, the story itself. Mm -hmm. uh, I did feel like, you know, this is a book about an unsolved crime. Mm -hmm. And and the problem with an open-ended story like that uh, is that it's dramatically unsatisfying if you never reach any sort of closure. Mm -hmm. I do feel as a reader that when you, you know, when you've had a complete uh, satisfying experience of a book, uh, it's because you've reached some kind of resolution at the end. I understand books that are left... Uh, without a without a true ending uh uh but i don't personally uh enjoy that experience as much especially a, a book like this mm -hmm. so that meant you know coming to some sort of meaningful conclusion uh meant uh building out that fourth book to be more than i originally intended and and again you have to find a way to do that 
uh, to, to resolve the case in a way that's satisfying to the reader without betraying uh, everything that came before, mm. which is, you know, a book about uh, the weight of doubt, the weight of not knowing, the weight of uh, mystery. Mm. And, you know, to resolve the mystery is to uh, take a lot of the magic out of the experience of the book, uh, what drove the book for so long. And isn't isn't true to life either. I mean, a lot of these cases, uh, even if they go all the way to a, to a guilty verdict, doubt remains. We, mm -hmm. we just never know. And, and so I wanted to be true to that. Yeah. I would say that you're the master of the drop mic at the end, okay? <laughs> drop mic. It's, I, I say you're the drop mic ending. And did you know the ending before you started? Did you know? Because no. this is like being- God, no. Drop mic. God, no. It's, it was a, it's a very hard book to end. Um, yeah. For just that reason um you know it's a book uh it's a book about doubt and yet books need to end so mm -hmm. i had a lot of sleepless nights over how this book could end yeah drop i'm gonna just say it's your drop mic and drop mic ending it's like eh, we're <laughs> out. there we go we're out i'll take that i need a i need a nickname <laughs> so when <laughs> defending jacob came out we all talked about it as a legal thriller like at the beginning it was a legal thriller and I don't feel like we're using that term quite the same way this year. Maybe we're using it for Grisham books. It's a legal thriller. And I feel like this book is a crime thriller. And I was reading and watching the Murdoch trial as this was going on. I mean, you talk about timing for a book coming out. And I was quite <laughs> like set up. And I wonder thoughts on that term of being a crime thriller because true crime is so big these days. It's just what happened and everybody gets invested in what's that. I mean, the number of people that were online writing about the Murdoch trial throughout and what they were thinking. And I was um, watching, I guess, when he was on the stand because I'd watched the Netflix thing the night before and I'm like, what is this? And then I listened to him and I'm like, whoa, this is so crazy to be listening mm -hmm. to this whole thing. But people were commenting, super invested in this along the side. And I would say 10 years ago when Defending Jay, we were in a different world and that same thing wouldn't have happened. Yes, there was the Anne Rule kind of true crime, but it's not that, it's not this, it's not this novel where it's like, it's a crime and this is what we're going to do about it. Am yeah. I crazy or no? It, no, I don't think you're crazy at all. I think it's it's part of the difficulty of being a novelist in this moment. How do you compete with the craziness of real life? Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> you know, and how do you, excuse me, how do you uh, address a reader who has been following the Murdoch case and who, uh, you know, who knows that these things do happen and knows that they can go to, you know, CNN.com or wherever they're watching this stuff and find an equally compelling story to anything that you could invent. And you're right, there are parallels between the two cases. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that the answer is you have to meet them where they are. You have mm -hmm. to say, you know, this story is like that, but more. Uh, this story, you will see parallels to to real life, uh, and yet you'll see a kind of depth as well that you just can't. Uh, that the, a, a true crime case like Murdoch can't uh, can't replicate. Mm -mm. But this this is part of the issue, and there's so much. Um, you know, I talk about a noisy uh, information environment that we're all living in. Uh, you know, in some ways, you you want to slow the reader down and say, close your computer, forget about Murdoch for a while. I'm going to ask you to for to have a longer, deeper uh, experience, but it's going to require something more of you than mm -hmm. just along in the chat room or tweeting about about Murdoch. Mm -hmm. uh, but in some ways, you have to acknowledge that this is the world your readers live in, and they are choosing to read your book as an alternative to uh, following, you know, the latest true crime case. Mm -hmm. And I think you have to be realistic that this is the world we live in now, and this is the world your readers live in now. And if you're not offering them an experience that has more depth uh, and, and is more satisfying in some ways than the latest uh, cheap thrills that, that you get from following a true crime case in real time like that, mm -hmm. uh, then there's no reason for them to prefer your book uh, to the experiences that they can get, you know, two clicks away. Mm -hmm. uh, so this, uh, I, I do think that this is something that uh, that writers need to 
think about. Mm -hmm. Well, it's true because you think about the Idaho killer and everybody was looking for that guy who killed the four people in Idaho. I mean, you had podcasts going about this of people talking and it's being reproduced on, you know, um, NBC and Dateline or something like that. Of like, what's called, let's, let's get right into the heart of the killer. Meanwhile, they're looking for the wrong model of car. They did have something that they can't release. The police can't say anything because it would give away what's going on. They stopped mm -hmm. this car twice. I mean, the, the amount that you get. Then we go back to the young woman that was killed in the a national forest by her boyfriend. And mm -hmm. everybody's looking for her in the forest and looking at what's going on. Right. So you've got people involved. You've got um, And you move citizen. from one to the next. It's one sensation after another. And what's interesting about that is it's the very uh, lack of information that makes it so compelling because it leaves mm -hmm. so much room for people to speculate in crazy ways. And that's what sells the story. That's part of the experience is not knowing. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in truth, if you really want to know what's, what's going on, just turn your phone off and wait mm -hmm. a few weeks until they figure it out. You know, mm -hmm. criminal cases, criminal investigations sometimes take time. Yeah. And uh, it's hard to convince people of that, though, because it, 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 the, the lack of information is the best asset for those stories. And in fact, the moment the crime is solved, uh, the audience moves on to the next thing because... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why stick around for the arraignment and the trial and the evidence? It's not just not June. It's not till June. It's, it's, <laughs> it, it, and it gets delayed. It's like when we can't go to trial, we got, we got to do this. And that's what real life is. But nobody that's really real cares. Life. Yeah. And, yep. The trial, the trial could be a year or two away. You know? right. The murder thing, a lot happened before this. Like a lot yeah. happened that there was a big setup to what was going on. So that case was almost too perfect. I assume they're going to be TV movies for years well, based on that one. Dateline did a thing like that Friday night that what well, <laughs> everything you knew and I was like whoa this is you know look and they Producers moved working overtime on that <laughs> but they moved Dateline to be up against um, CBS and uh, what's the show it's on oh I said the, um, 60 minutes when they realize that they're going to put Dateline against 60 minutes you realize where the American people are right now yeah. because you would not take a show like that normally it used to be like some entertainment show now you throw Dateline up against it. You see right. what's going on. You see what's going and it's on. The, it's country. the trivialization of of news. You, you at one point you wouldn't have put Dateline up against uh, sixty minutes because that's one is a, a serious news show and the other one was meant to be lighter. Yes. Now we think of that as news, and mm -hmm. we're we're much more willing to consider speculation and punditry and opinion uh, as as serious news, and it it impoverishes the the marketplace of of real ideas and and of real discussion it it's a shame in some ways and it's led to a lot of the political problems that we have now where we can't seem to agree even on on what's fact and what's fiction mm -hmm. what is who said what, what they did i had a friend that years ago was with the fbi and he goes you know the white house said every day he goes there's a briefing that comes out every morning that's the white house said he goes right. it's on a piece of paper everybody gets the same thing he said, it's the White House said, you know, and then you can pretend you heard from the White House. He goes, it's yeah. on the piece of paper everyone gets. <laughs> it's really funny. It was really good. So what did the success of Defending Jacob have on you? Did it make you pr pressure to do another, your next book? Did it make you say, I can sit back for a while? Or was there any? <laughs> no, that I can sit you. back for a while. I don't have that gene. <laughs> In between uh, these 10 years, you were actually moseying around with this book. You were playing with it. Yeah, I was I was uh, uh, struggling to make it work. Uh, honestly, as I said, uh, I don't feel that this work ever gets any easier. And um, it certainly wasn't about taking it easy because I just don't know how to do that. Um, so what it did, I think it bought me the luxury of aiming higher, uh, mm -hmm. honestly, because you know, it, it gives you a readership uh, that's exponentially larger than the one that you brought into it. Mm -hmm. And I, as I said, I, I didn't want to, uh, to me, what I would have considered throwing away that privilege of having a readership uh, by lowering my sights. I wanted mm -hmm. to, uh, you know, give my readers something that was equally satisfying or more and, and that wasn't a book that they would have predicted coming from me necessarily. Mm -hmm. I don't think you would uh, 
read Defending Jacob and and expect that that all that his mind I carry with me is going to be what he's going to follow it up with. Uh, but again, uh, like the bands and the movie directors that we talked about, uh, if you found a writer that you trust, and and I do promise to my readers that I never mail it in. <laughs> I'm not trying to get singles. I am swinging for the fences each time. That doesn't mean I may strike out, but that's the intention. And I want my readers to know that. And I think that they'll, you know, they'll stick with you through a few strikeouts if they know that you are, uh, that that's your approach. Mm -hmm. um, and I want that always to be my, my approach. You know, I never, I'm not the the kid who grew up thinking, oh, I, I need to be a writer. Uh, this is the only thing I could ever be. It's my destiny. Uh, there were no writers <laughs> in my universe uh, growing up, and it still doesn't strike me as a real <laughs> job, or certainly not a real career, since there's no, uh, you know, there's no paycheck, there's no health plan, there's no none of this stuff. <laughs> uh, so for me, I kind of feel like this is a privilege, and <laughs> you know, I've I have always liked the old joke that that being a writer is like being a gladiator. You know, the the reward for winning a gladiator fight is you get to fight again the next yeah. week and that's you know you get to fight until you lose once um and there's something similar with novel writing you go from project to project you're never guaranteed that there'll be a second or third or fourth book after this and so every time you step up to the plate you should write as if the last book this is the last book that you will ever have the privilege uh mm -hmm. of writing mm -hmm. and our society extends that privilege to very few people Mm -hmm. And you should make the most of it. It's a gift that you have been given. It's the gift of time. It's the gift of a readership. Uh, it's the gift of a publisher who will support you in this. And to me, it's silly to take that gift and squander it uh, mm -hmm. on, on books that are uh, easy or superficial or unsatisfying uh, you might as well swing for the fences because why not? You know, what's the, <laughs> the what's the point of hitting singles? Yes, Aaron I mean, didn't get paid because he's a singles hitter. <laughs> exactly, exactly. This weekend, a friend said she had no idea that Defending Jacob was a book. She watched it on Apple TV. <laughs> now, this is what's really funny, though. This is interesting. She's 24, which means yeah. she was 14 when Defending Jacob came out. Yeah. That was not a book she would have read at 14. So there's right. a whole readership that in these 10 years became familiar with the show, mm -hmm. said, oh, there's a book. I wish I'd known there was a book and I read it first, is what she said to me. And Carol, she says, you're creating this reverse incentive for me because now I know that all I have to do between books is wait long enough for an entire readership to come of age and become available to me and I can start but, selling books. But it's really super crazy because she was 14 at the time. And I sat there and I said, you know, there you go. You know, you've also, <laughs> there you go, there you go. It's true though. And it does point up too though, like how how exponentially larger the audience is That's for, exactly. for TV and movies than it is for books. We and live was, in a world of books, so it seems like the universe to us, but it's a small fraction of the population that actually reads. Yeah. And it was an Emmy nominated Apple TV show. I loved it. Did you get involved at all? You didn't write the, you didn't write the script, did you? Or did you? And I missed that. No, I didn't. There's a wonderful, uh, uh, screenwriter named Mark Baumbach, who was the driving force behind the whole project, really. Um, he was the, the prime mover at the start, and he wrote all of the scripts. Wow. Uh, at the beginning, it's it's a very small project, and so it's Mark and me kind of speaking. And he uh, he's a New York guy, and he didn't know Boston. He wasn't a lawyer. He hadn't you know been in a courtroom. And so at the beginning, there was a lot of collaboration just in uh, me supporting him, me mm -hmm. uh, trying to enable him to to do this in a way to, to pull it off. Uh, as the project goes along and more and more people uh, attach, the, there's a lot of chefs in the kitchen. And increasingly, I was less essential to the project. <laughs> and I have no uh, <laughs> no hard feelings about that at all. I always thought that uh, you should never be a novelist should never be uh, proprietary or defensive uh, about a book because a movie is a, a new uh, uh, project in a new medium. Mm -hmm. And 
the goal of that project isn't to translate your book to film uh, accurately or faithfully. The, the, the project is to make a good movie. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the things that you would put in a book because they will work in a book simply won't work on screen. There's a lot of literary devices that, that just don't translate and you need to allow for that. And so the reason you uh, pick your producers carefully is you trust them. You mm -hmm. trust them to take the clay that you've given them and mold it into something new. Uh, so what I would tell your 24 year old reader who was 14 then <laughs> is just that. That um, you read know, the book. Yeah, I said yeah, don't. don't read the book. I think there's a, a feeling that I heard Lee Child say once that uh, people people tend to think that the the novel is the larval form of the story and the movie <laughs> is the butterfly. <laughs> and obviously, from the novel novelist point of view, it just isn't so. The novel is the fully grown butterfly. butterfly. Right, and right, right. You read it as a final product. But you know, even where you have your dialogue just going back and forth. That's the way a, a script is. It's back and forth. It's not like the actor is to put their personification on whatever it is and say yes or yes or yes, like or yeah. do whatever they're going to do. That's acting. Acting is, is not the same thing that's on the page. It's not the same, you know, pickup or whatever. And remember too that the um the way you would write dialogue for a book is stylized. It's meant to be read in your head and to be heard internally. If you were writing for an actor to speak those lines aloud, uh, you might shape it differently. And that's why you want screenwriters to uh, to not feel beholden to the book. Mm -hmm. too much. Yeah, they can't be able to do that. So the title we talked about, the cover, was this something they played around with on the cover? I'm trying to get it not shine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a little bit. Um, there were a few different options. Um, I, I love this one, though. I, I yeah, love it. Really it's really evocative and I just love the colors. I just think it's a, it's a beautiful cover. Um, I usually dress to match the book and I have a lot of turquoise. I'm, I'm very it's impressed. It worked very well for me when I went in my closet to do my, what am I going to wear? So there you go. That's You have the perfect okay. sweater for this book. <laughs> the perfect sweater. I'll go on tour with the sweater. Okay. <laughs> Lend it to me. I'll need it for the tour. Yeah, that's exactly. The ensemble <laughs> cast is something you, did you cast the, actually the four people that are the um, ensemble cast that do this book? Did you cast them? Oh, for the audio book, you mean? Yeah, for the audio book. Yeah, I'm sorry, for the audio book. Um, I, I uh, approved them, essentially. Okay, uh, or, got it. Chimed in on them. Um, so, yeah, they went through the initial casting, though. They okay. choose, I did, it's it's interesting because I think that you're looking for actors who can, who's, who can capture the personality of the speakers with their voices alone. Mm -hmm. And that's a very difficult assignment. It was important to me that... Uh, uh, you know, that, uh, so Jeff's voice, he's kind of a smart ass, uh, you know, rise sort of, uh, snarky guy. And it was important that you find an actor who could capture that. So these different, uh, actors, uh, really do matter because when you're reading it, you can infer that and you'll hear yeah. that in your head. Yeah. with the audio book. It really has to be obvious. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> well, I hope we don't have to wait 10 more years. I hope we don't have to, I don't hope. want to be cultivating your 14 year old audience now. You're like, I don't want to be doing that. I don't want to be doing that. It's been such a pleasure. It's always, it's, it, I loved it because you have a lot where you feel that the authors should not be speaking. The characters in the book should be speaking for themselves. And I've heard you talk about that more than once. And yeah. it's interesting that we were able to share, you were able to share so much with us today, because I think it's really good to hear where you were coming from as you wrote each part of the book. So, yeah. Well, now that I've now that I've said that the author should just keep his mouth shut up, I'll, I'll shut up now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. It's been such a pleasure. Nice and to see our, you, Carol. Our listeners and viewers, we'll see you next time on Book Reporter Talks to where you can find us always. The videos are on YouTube and podcast is wherever you listen to podcasts. It's Book Reporter Talks to. Thanks so much, everybody. <laughs>